I've got a pretty cool secret. Did you know that there is nothing you could say or show me? No testimony, no evidence to talk me into believing that God isn't real? That Jesus didn't come and die for my sins? See, my faith is bulletproof. And I think it's there because it's in my heart. It has indwelled my heart to a point where there is nothing you can come to talk me out of it. I've seen too much, too much evidence, too much proof, too much love, too many miracles. There's too much for you to prove to me that it's not true. But that's not the truth for everyone. It's come up twice this week. Two different people have asked the question, how do I get my head knowledge of the Bible? Because I believe the Bible is true. But how do I know that I know that I know that I'm saved? How do I get that head knowledge into my heart? The first guy this week said, I, I know all these things in the Bible. The Bible's written down. I read it. I believe it because I'm supposed to believe it. But the question is, is how do I get it from my head to my heart so that I feel it? So that my faith is bulletproof. The second one said, I don't know if I'm saved because of my past. See, I feel that the Bible is true for everyone else, but not for me. Because of my own reality, I can't see God being a loving, loving me in that way. So I read the Bible and I know knowledge in my knowledge, in my head knowledge, that it's supposed to be true. But I don't feel it in my heart. I got to thinking about this issue because this is probably a truth for a lot of people and you need to have bulletproof faith because our society is starting to melt down. The signs and seasons are all around us. The time is running short and things are going to get really hard. And are you going to have what it takes to stand and persevere to the end and be saved as it says in John? Now, I don't want you to mistake faith and salvation with what you believe because I believe that we hold ourselves way heavier than even God does the Bible tells us if you have faith in God and you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and was raised again you'll be saved that's it faith in those two things is what the Bible tells us. But we get ourselves caught up in the belief of all these other words and all these other thousands upon thousands of verses and somehow I'm supposed to know all these things. That's no, that's, that's not true. How do we get head knowledge, belief that God's word is in, is in our head because we read it and we, act, we, can, we can read from Genesis to Revelation. We can read the words and we can say, I believe them, what is written here. But how do we get it to a point where, where when the chips are down, I believe it wholeheartedly for myself because God's real and Jesus is real and you can't tell me otherwise. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But let's start with the heart. The Bible uses the word heart and uses the term heart eight to nine hundred times in here. It's a main central portion. And it's not talking about the organ in the middle of your chest. It's talking about your very essence. We know that in Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 that you're supposed to guard your heart with all diligence for out of it flows the issues of life. Well, that's not talking about your ticker. That's talking about who you are, how you handle things, who you work for, what you do, how you feel, what you think, much like your soul, the very essence of who you are. And if we're reading the Bible, it tells us in Psalm 119 verse 11, I need to deposit your word into my heart so that I do not sin against you. How do we do that? How do we get the word of God from our head and our head knowledge into our heart so we use it and believe it and live it and understand it. Well, I started in Mark because I started to think about how our heart kind of works in our favor or it doesn't. James says it very clearly in, a, in kind of a parable when he says, you can't have salt water and clean, and clean water, um, 
salt water and pure water out of the same spring. It's either one or the other, and your heart can't do both. It either gives out what's defiled or it gives out what is fruitful. Jesus would speak later. He would say, you know, you know a man by his fruit. A good tree doesn't make bad fruit. And a, bad tr a bad tree doesn't make good fruit. You're looking to, to set yourself up using the word to form and shape and mold and get you ready for being a good tree that bears good fruit. We know that Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitfully wicked. Who could know it? It's, it's deceptive. Our very, our very essence is sinful unless we seek after God's word to bury it in our heart and move that knowledge from our head to our heart so that we know God. And it moves us to act in such a, in a holy manner. Jesus is speaking about defiling, a defiled heart in Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 14. He says, when he had called all the multitude to himself, he said to them, hear me, everyone, and understand. There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him. The argument here is, is the Pharisees are, why aren't you washing your hands? You're going to defile yourself. And Jesus is like, that's not how this works. Even the foods you're not supposed to eat won't defile you. We learn that later in Acts, but it isn't what you eat that defiles you. It isn't what you touch that defiles you. It isn't your sins that defile you. It's what comes out of your heart from the internal that defiles you. That's what he's going to say. It doesn't, nothing that comes from the outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has an ear to hear, let him hear. Verse 17, when he had entered the house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And so he said to them, are you thus without understanding? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach. And it's eliminated, thus purifying all food. And he said, what comes out of a man that defiles a man from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceitful, uh, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. These are horrible things. They come from inside that defile who we are. All of these evil things come from within that defile a man. Jesus is saying it isn't what's what you put into your body that defiles you. It's what comes out of the very center of your being. Like I said, James says you can't have salt water and fresh water from the same, from the same well. And if it says here that a, that a man who is, who is defiled in his heart would bring these kinds of points out, then we know where the good stuff comes from too. Galatians chapter 5 tells us that. He's going to reiterate the same point. Look what it says. Verse 16, I say then, walk in the spirit. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh, defiling from the heart, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. Sounds like the same list, doesn't it? Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. All these things that are defiled from our heart. Not from what we do on the outside, but what comes from our inside, our sinful being on the inside. It says here, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But there is a caveat to this, that there is other stuff that can come from the heart. Fruit of the Spirit is love joy, peace, long-suffering, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against there is no law for these things. 
See, we, we need to realize, first of all, what defiles a man. And we need to realize that where that def that defiled that defilement comes from can also be a pure a, a pure place where good things, the fruits of the spirit, come from. If you are able to take the word and move it from your head into your heart, so you feel that way. Yeah, it's easier said than done, isn't it? That's that's the question. That's the point I'm making here. How do you do that? Well. I've put a lot of thought into this. I've been, I've been meditating on it. And for me, I need to realize that the Bible is a love letter from God. He made Adam and Eve in Genesis, and they had this wonderful relationship until sin entered. Sin then created rebellion against God, and God needed, to just, needed justice to deal with the rebellion. That justice is death. He told Adam, you shall surely die. Up until the point that Jesus died on the cross, that was the point. You either killed something that was innocent to cover over your sins, animal sacrifice, until Jesus, the Lamb of God, came to die once for everyone in the of all time, to take away the sins of the world, world, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. John the Baptist told him that. And when you realize that he's done this for you, do you accept it? Like I said, when I, I, I read the story. I, can, I can't. I read the story. That's what it says. I'm supposed to believe the word of God, and therefore I believe it as true. But do you believe it? Do you feel it? Have you been there? I, I don't think that I, I don't think that I am. I, I, I believe it for everyone else, but not for me. I, I think my past and my sinful behavior is so bad that he doesn't believe, this doesn't apply to me. But the Bible tells us that it applies to everyone. And it isn't about what you've done or what you do or what you're going to do. It's about whether you believe. But in that belief, you got you got you need a bulletproof faith by really putting it into and depositing it in your heart so you believe. How do you do that? Well, I started thinking about these two men. Because what is the picture? What is the picture of the Bible that is the most important situation in all the Bible? The crucifixion, the death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because if Jesus died but he wasn't sinless, then it doesn't matter because we're still in our sins. If Jesus died and stayed dead, then it doesn't matter because even though he died for our sins, we're still going to die with him, so who cares? He needed to die for our sins and resurrect so that we would understand that we resurrect too. And that gives us eternal life in heaven. That's the, that's the key. You have to believe that wholeheartedly. Because believing in God and believing in Jesus and believing he was raised from the dead will be... That's how you get saved. It says so in the book of Romans. But I was starting to wonder if this is the most important part of this story. How do I get to the point where I know that I know that I know that Jesus did this for me? And I came to the conclusion that I have to put myself in the story I need to be the one. I need to be Barabbas. I need to be the one hanging on the cross. And there's two men hanging on the cross. Which one do I want to be? Which one do I need to be? And that's what we're going to talk about. I want you to put yourself in this story. Because when you realize in your own heart, in your own story, in your own life, that Jesus did this for you too, the story isn't just one situation or one opportunity. It's, it, it applies to everyone ever to exist. Let me show you what I mean. Matthew chapter 27, verse 15. We were, he's been arrested and now he's on trial. And it says here in verse 15, it says, Now at the feast, the governor, Pontius Pilate, was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time... They had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. And therefore, 
when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? Now, Barabbas was an insurrectionist. He was a zealot, and he tried to raise an uproar against Rome, and he murdered some people, and he's in jail for murder. He's facing the death penalty. Now, Pontius Pilate now has... They've come to Pontius and said, you need to kill this guy named Jesus. And he says, you kill him. And they're like, well, we can't. The law says that only Rome can do capital punishment. Interesting, because they end up stoning Stephen in the book of Acts against hypocrisy everywhere. But they, gotta, they don't want to have their hands dirty by killing Jesus. So they allow the Gentile nation to do so. Interestingly, the Gentiles and the Jews had both of their part in killing Jesus. Interesting fact. But he, he picks Barabbas because Barabbas is a horrible person and he says, all right, I'm going to pick Barabbas and I'm going to put, I'm going to pit Barabbas with Jesus up there because I know who the people will pick. Listen to what it says here. It says, therefore, verse 17, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ. He's using very specific words here in an effort to get the people to choose Jesus because he needs to wipe his hands clean of this situation that's getting out of control in his mind. Look, I like verse 18. It says, For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. Pontius Pilate is leaning on the idea here that if he presents a really bad person, to go up against Jesus, that although these religious rulers want him dead because of envy, they don't want him to come in and to pull away their power and strength. They figure that the people will choose well. So he leaves them up there. That's what he is hoping will happen. Because he knew that the, he knew that the, that the, uh, the religious rulers weren't going to go with this. They wanted Jesus dead for a very, very different reason. And, and everybody in the town loved Jesus. So he had set it up. He had, he had pitted them against each other in an effort to get Jesus picked. It doesn't work. It says in verse 19, While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him saying, Have nothing to do with this just man, for I have suffered many things tonight, today in a dream because of him. She had a bad dream about Jesus being being innocent. And Pontius Pilate is in a place to just deal with it, but yet he's being swept away by a number of geopolitical issues that we won't get into today. But he's being forced. His hand is being forced. Why? Because it's the providence of God. Keep that in mind. Verse 20, but the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, which of the two of you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas to most likely Pontius Pilate's surprise, Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus who's called the Christ? And they all said to him, let him be crucified. Just murder him. And, and the governor said, why? What evil has he done? He has already investigated this, has, knows that Jesus hasn't done anything, knows he's not willing for death, and he's playing this game. Instead of just releasing him and saying, I'm not going to do this, he's having issues in his own mind about this. And he's surprised that, the, that they're calling for his crucifixion and a releasing of the murderer who's thrown in prison. But they cried all the more, saying, let, him be, let Jesus be crucified. Verse 24, and when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of, the, of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, his blood is on us and on our children. And he released Barabbas to them. And then he had scourged Jesus. He delivered him to be crucified. Now, how do we, how do you put yourself in this position easy? Barabbas is a sinner. Jesus is not. And put yourself in Barabbas's place. And there you are standing up there before the multitudes. And Pontius Pilate looks and says, who do I release? You, this man over here who has done who knows what kind of horrible things in his life. Make sure you justly understand that you're a sinner, 
all people are sinners. No one, no one is good. No, not one, according to Paul. You have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. And we are all facing spiritual death. Okay? So we're Barabbas. We're seriously standing up on death row, waiting to be executed. And Pontius Pilate is saying, do we kill Jesus or do you, we, do we kill Matt? And I deserve to be <laughs> Jesus, sinless man who's been casting out demons and raising people from the dead and feeding people and making fish and doing all these things. He's never sinned not once, not even in his thoughts or words. And yet, and, and here I am. I mean, I feel guilty about it, even in this position. And yet, Jesus didn't raise a sound. He said nothing. They release Barabbas to the crowd and Jesus goes to the cross. Why? Because Jesus died for you. Jesus took your place. You were, you were this man deserving of death and yet because Jesus died for you, you are free. The man who is free is free indeed. See, when we put ourselves in Barabbas' situation, we start to feel what it is going, the, the heavy burden that leans upon us because we're guilty and he's not, and yet he took the punishment for us. And that's how we start to move it into that big knot in our throat when we try to swallow, when our heart burns and it hurts because of the love that God has for us by sending his only son. That's, that's story number one. Well, we know that once he's mocked, he's scourged, he's beaten, his beard's pulled out, he is unrecognizable. I'm going to tell you something. I've been on at least one call I can remember as a police officer. When, when her, the woman's face was beaten so bad, I have no idea what she looked like. And I was there in the hospital She'd gotten attacked by a man with a clawed hammer. And it was a miracle God had saved her life. And one of the greatest miracles I have ever ended up understanding. But I'm looking at her driver's license and I can't identify her because she's so beaten. That's what they say. Jesus was marred. He was beaten so bad he was unrecognizable. You couldn't even tell he was a man. And yet they... They drug him through the scourging and the beating and the crown of thorns and blood everywhere. And then they nail him to that cross. That cross is the worst form of death ever to be devised by men. And not only that, but Jesus, Jesus was... He, he, not only was it a physical pain and a physical suffering and a physical marring and a physical destruction, it also was spiritual and emotional because God forsook Jesus. Now we kind of think about, oh, I don't know, is God there? Is he not there? I don't know. But uh, we talked about that yesterday, but, but he actually turned away from his son, leaving Jesus by himself to suffer the sins of of all time. Put yourself in the position of that. When we put ourselves in this position of suffering when it's not fair, when it should be me and it should be you, we start to realize the gravity of what's happened. Well, he's thrown up on the cross. Verse 35, Matthew 27, 35 says, Then they crucified him, and he divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. And two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. 
Likewise, the chief priests also mocked with the scribes and elders, saying, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him down. Let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers were, who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. We would understand that those religious rulers would do that. That they would come against him, make fun of him, revile him. They hated him. They put him to death. But he's hanging up there with these two men. One on his left, one on his right. Both of which were robbers. They deserve to be up there. They're sinners. They've done something against Rome, and Rome only used crucifixion against Jewish guys, uh, about the Jewish. It was so bad, they didn't even allow their own citizens to be crucified. So only the Jews were crucified. And they used it in a point to say, hey, man, don't cross Rome. It was a, it was a gruesome picture. And both of those guys are up there reviling Jesus. Who doesn't, no one can, you can't even identify him. That's us. Pick your poison. Are you the one on the left? Or are you the one on the right? But you're reviling Jesus. You deserve to be up there and Jesus does not. And you don't understand what Jesus is doing. <laughs> you start to mock the son of God. Now, if you don't know him, that's fine. You don't understand that point great but i want you to know that in this in this story they're both they're both reviling him and he is suffering for no fault of his own now why this story is important is because in john's gospel i'm sorry in luke's gospel there's a little bit of a different story in this this is what it says Luke 23, verse 32, it says, There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. You remember when Jesus was in Gethsemane and Peter pulled a sword and tried to chop that Malchus's ear off, right? And, and Jesus is like, put your sword away. I, you know I can call 12 legions of angels to handle this if, you want, if I need to, right? You don't need to help me here. I have it all under control. This has to be done. This has to be done. And he's, he's sitting up there suffering greater than any man has ever suffered because the sins of all time are laying on the Son of God up there for no reason. He didn't, he didn't commit a single sin, and yet he is taking the punishment, the wrath of God for everything that has ever been done. All the way back to Adam and Eve. And what does he say? He says, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And they divided his garments and cast lots. Verse 35, and the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, he saved others, let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of the God. The soldiers who mocked him coming and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanging blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, you save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. 
put yourself on the cross. You're a criminal. You're a sinner. You deserve death. And here's the, here's the kicker. Comparative to Jesus, it doesn't matter what you've done. You deserve it more than him. Because he's sinless. And we were born sinners. David's like, I was born in iniquities. And in sin I was conceived. I've been a sinner since I, since I became. We were, we were born into sin because, of the, of the, because we were born into the blood of Adam. That's the whole point of not allowing our, we need to have our body dead and resurrected in a spiritual way, in a new way. That's the sinfulness of Adam is taken out. When you're born again, your spirit and your soul are restored and justified to, to eternal glory. But your body's not. And therefore, we're in this battle against our flesh. We read that in Galatians. The spirit wars against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. We're going to continue to fight this battle and we're going to continue to sin. But Jesus has died for those sins. But there you are, hanging there. Jesus is standing there, and one man is to the right, and one man is to the left. Now, just a revelation, something I just realized here, that Jesus, at the end of time, will he's going to see, these are the sheep, and I'm going to put them on my right hand. I'm going to put the goats over here on my left hand. Sheep will go with me. I'm the shepherd. The goats will go to eternal darkness and hell. And it just so turns out that there's a man hanging on the right that is saved and a man hanging on the left who is not. He blasphemes God. We know that blaspheming the Holy Spirit is the only sin that which cannot be saved. Which one are you? The one to give your picture, this holy, this, this decrepit life you've lived. Think about it. There you are hanging up on the cross. And this man looks down, looks at Jesus. And between him and Jesus is his hand with a nail driven into it. He sees that decrepit nail in his hand and he knows that he's being punished rightly for what he's done. And beyond that is Jesus who doesn't deserve it. But he did it for you. He died so that we could have communion with God. Because without that death, without that beating, without that wrath, without that destroyed body over there, without watching that happen, without that, I have no place I can go except hell. When you put yourself in the position in that fire, when you put yourself in that scene, and you realize what he did for you, it starts to get into the heart. Now it's not just words on a page anymore. Now it's, now it's me. And it's you. Which man do you want to be? The one on the cross on the left who doesn't care about God, doesn't believe in God, doesn't really, wants to do it his own way and wants to go and face God in judgment day on his own? Or do you want to be the one on the right who says, you know what, I believe who you are, Jesus. I believe that you are you are the son of God, that you are sinless and you are dying for me. And when you go to your kingdom, remember me. And Jesus says, you will be with me in paradise. Only takes faith. Believing Jesus did this for you. To have all of the glory that would be given to you. In Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, in John chapter 23, uh, oh. here's the thing. If you're pushing to move this narrative, this story, this whole story, by the way, John doesn't have 23 chapters. 
So I don't know where I'm going there. If you want to be, if you want to move what's written in this book into the depths of our mind, from our mind into our heart, I did this by putting myself in the story. And when I realized that I didn't, I don't deserve any, I don't deserve anything. I deserve hellfire. So many people are like, I want what I deserve. You don't. You don't want what you deserve. You want God's grace. You want what God has promised you through this book. But you have to understand why that's important. You have to understand that you're a sinner. You're going to have to humble yourself and accept that. Because so many people are like, no, I'm a good person. And, and, and we live a life, the life that we live, we want, we want to be we want to be compared to other people. And, and, and your life feels good because you're better than someone else. I don't know how many people have told me, ah, you know what, I'm better than, I'm not as bad as Hitler, so I'm okay. It's not how God works. It's not how God works. All people have sinned, and that one sin will be your demise into hell. So you better realize that you've made mistakes, that's all a sin is, is a mistake. And that you need a savior to save you. That's all you have to do. Believe that Jesus did that in your heart. It's got to go into your heart. You've got to believe that and not just say it and then go off and live your life unchanged. Because the spirit is going to change your life. Jesus Christ will change your life. And when it gets down into this heart and you pour into this heart, you will find out that that everything you do and think and say will be centered around the one who died for you because you couldn't do it on your own. That you got a second chance for eternity because he is the one who is faithful, even when you're faithless. To get yourself buried inside the story and get all of this knowledge in this book into your heart, you got to put yourself into the story. Put yourself in the place of Barabbas. Put yourself up on that cross. Looking through that nail in your hand at a, at a bloody and beaten Jesus who's dying for your sins. And either you blaspheme him or you tell him that you want him to remember you. The man who blasphemed him is in hell. The man who Ask Jesus to remember him is in heaven. Our heart is a wellspring and all the issues of life come out of it. And you can live a fruitful life. If you accept Jesus, that Jesus would bring the spirit within you and this spirit, the fruits of the spirit would pour out of you. And I can attest to all of this because I was not deserving of any of it. None of it. Shoot. <sighs> Always distractions. The last thing. If you haven't accepted Jesus, accept him now. Today is the day of salvation and I don't know when the rapture happens. I do not know when the rapture is going to happen. And once it happens, you'll be left here to deal with the seven worst years of all of mankind's life. And if you survive it, you'll be beheaded by the Antichrist if you seek after living for Jesus. This isn't something you should toil with. Step away from the line of sin. Realize your need for a Savior and tell him in prayer. It's just a discussion with God and say, look, I need to give my life to you. Turn away, forgive my sins, and walk after you. Get into the story. Because I can see myself in a lot of the stories in this book. 
and it allows me to see the heart of God deeper and deeper and deeper and it moves it from my head into my heart and I feel it. And so you can't tell me God's not real. You can't do it at all. And I know who my maker is. I know who my, sal my savior is. I know who is in charge of my salvation. My redeemer lives and I have a better place to go. I'm just a sojourner in this place until that my mansion that Jesus speaks about is ready for me to go home. Live in the story. Bury these truths in your heart. And let's get out of here. Until then, be blessed.